welcome back to the Foundation Be Shaken. And we're going to deal with, we dealt with the book of, with the earlier core the book of Deuteronomy. And I'm going to deal with what's called the Deuteronomy history. Now I need to air a little bit of caution here. Well, most people, if they know anything about the book scholarship, they're going to think of the Deuteronomy history. So like Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, King. The thing is, probably about 60-70% of that is not the Deuteronomy history. And what I mean by that is there's large chunks of 2 Samuel, uh, large chunks of Joshua, and the entire book of Judges that are later layers. There is a, well, Richard Elliott Friedman had proposed, if you, if you look on um, any books, he's got, which obviously I, he's, he's a biblical maximalist, but he proposes, uh, he had a book called The Hidden Book in the Bible, where he proposes that the J source continues into all the other books. And I think he's absolutely right about that. So there's a lot of J material, especially in Second Samuel. And then if you take that, you realize that the, there's not one Deuteronomist. There's an early Deuteronomist, which we're talking about now, and then there's a later la layer that knew the J source. So there's at least three layers. So what we're dealing with today is the earliest core of the Deuteronomy history. So it starts with the book of Deuteronomy. And again, as I emphasized on my last video, we immediately, right after, you know, you've gotten through Deuteronomy 12, 26, you've isolated what's probably the earliest law code, and get in Deuteronomy 27, and Moses says, now I'm going to give you the blessings and the curses. Oh, Moses, what are the blessings? Did you mention them? They're not here. They're gone. They're missing. So this entire chapter is, I would argue, the late edition. So this is not in the earliest version of the Deuteronomy. And unfortunately, we've lost part of it anyway. So what we go into, if, if you follow from the, from the law code into Deuteronomy 28.1, it makes perfect sense. So if you will only obey Yahweh your God by dealing observing all his commandments that I'm commanding you today then and then we get into a somewhat beautiful part well you know he'll set you on high you'll go to your enemies they'll flee from you seven ways you'll plant your parties everything you'll be blessed and it goes through blessing 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 this is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible because if you can get through that blessing about 80 percent of this chapter is curses and it's not just, there is a rebuttal for almost every single blessing, but then it just gets, it, it, it starts getting way, I mean, some of the things it says, it, it's rather ridiculous. You'll be mad all the time, the skies above you will be, I mean, it, it, it gets insane, literally insane, some of these curses. So, there, this is a, somewhat of a dark chapter. And even in this chapter, there are additions to this that are not in the earliest core. Like, you know, it seems to be essentially that if you don't obey these laws, you'll be exiled, and that's it. Although there is a later addition that says, well, if you're exiled, you'll come back. You know, he'll bring you back. All of chapter 29 is late, so we'll skip that. And notice, if you go from the blessings and curses into chapter 30, verse 1, when all these things have happened to you, the blessings and the curses, so chapter 29, late interpolation. And this is actually one of the best chapters in the Bible. Um, you know, it says, uh, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. You will love Yahweh your God with all your heart. Then you obey Yahweh, etc. And it says, this, now this, if you're going to get, if you, when we get to the New Testament, I want you to remember this. Because, um, Deuteronomy 30 verse 11, Surely the commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in the heaven that you should say, Who will go up to the heaven for us and get it for us, so we may hear it and deserve it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it, so that we may hear it and deserve it? Know the word is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. First Corinthians takes this as the logo. So just so you know that... That kind of interesting. Oh, is it, sorry, not First Corinthians. Romans take this at the logo, which we'll get to when we get. But this is in chapter thirty, 
Um, and then essentially, uh, much of this later edition we get through. Now, in Joshua, let's move into Joshua. Because you're going to notice something. Look for this catchphrase. Be courageous and strong. Watch this. Watch this. Watch. Watch what I do. After the death of Moses, the servant of Yahweh, Yahweh spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses assistant saying, Moses, my servant, is dead, etc., etc., etc. Now, he gives and tells them all the territory. Uh, no man shall be able to stand against you. As I was Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you. If you think you be strong and courageous. There we go, okay? Next verse. What's the next verse say? Be strong and courageous. What what just happened? What 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 just happened to? Be careful to act in accordance with all the law. This book famous line, this book of the law, not to pipe in your mouth, you should meditate on it day and night. And in verse nine, there you go. Be strong, courage, courageous, do not be frightened or dismayed. Now what's happened here is there are three layers to the, the there's an early layer that originally said be strong and courageous and then what we call the priestly source had taken over part of it that's the lighter last half of its chapter and there's a J source that's in the middle so it's kind of a, a, a box chapter much of the book of Joshua comes from the J source and the P source so on the other hand what we have here we have on the spies that's going to be later these are all later stories all about Jericho well that's where it gets a bit interesting it seems that the Jericho story was originally in here, but it probably wasn't the wall fell down plot. It probably was originally a conquest story. And what's interesting about Jericho is if you go through this list, and there's been additions made to the Jericho story, including the sins of Achan, where you take something that's devoted to destruction or put under the ban, and then you emphasize that every single Canaanite um, city is supposed to be put to the edge of the sword. There is no exception in the Deuteronomy for Rahab. That's going to be added later. And the Gibeonites also. Everything to be put under the under the ban to the edge of the sword. The later story that has Achan taking something devoted to destruction is kind of interesting because what the original Deuteronomy had here, everything needs to be destroyed and with the city of Jericho can't take anything for spoil. Why? Well, giving all the additions, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, we get to chapter 10. So we get the conquest of AI, which probably originally was a simple conquest, not this horrible defeat. They're allowed to take things. Chapter 10, we get the big battle. Quote from the book of Jazer. Probably originally the battle story from the book of Jazer had been in, in, inserted in here. And if you go through chapter 10, and you count from Jericho, AI, all through the cities in chapter 10. How many cities are there? Anybody guess? 10. Why would Jericho, you see this is the literary competition. Why would Jericho, you can't take anything but all the others you can. You probably figured it out by now. Tithe. They gotta give the first fruits, the tenth. They had to give that to Yahweh, and the rest they can take. And essentially, this account ends. Joshua took all the land according to all that Yahweh promised Moses. Now there is one exception to this, and that's Hazor. And I, I need to emphasize this. I, I don't know why people don't get this, because they get to the Deuteronomy history, they think, oh, well, that flows into the Book of Judges. No, Judges is a later addition to Deuteronomy history. There's a J layer and there's a later Deuteronomy layer that made up the entire book of Judges. The early layers didn't have the book of Judges. And if you, you pull a mess to her who probably had the book of Judges, it said everything went from Moses to Joshua to Samuel. There's no Judges. Judges is a... Is, well, listen to this. Joshua 11 verse 1, I'm going to prove it to you that Judges is a late addition. When King, King Jabin of Hazor heard of this, he sent to, and we get this battle of Hazor. What do you see here? King Jabin of Hazor. Who is a historical individual? They're getting this from Syrian sources. 
Interesting, huh? Okay, now, you think the Deuteronomy 63 is written by one guy? And not several layers? Okay, watch this. He's about to get resurrected, because he, he, they're all, everyone's killed in Joshua chapter 10. Let's go to Judges chapter 4. Uh, verse 2, so Yahweh sent them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in his order, the commander of Darmus, sister. Um, did he come back to life several hundred years later? No, this is a later author, who's just going to use stuff from Joshua. It doesn't. Did, so, originally Joshua, and, and essentially with Joshua, took all the land according to all the Yahweh promised Moses, that's going to be, P is going to say, actually, not really, but it, it, essentially it's going to be like that. Now, chapter, yeah, essentially that's where it ended. Now, there's a couple of speeches at the end of Joshua. One is P, one is did second Deuteronomy play. So again, if you go right from that, you end up into the Samuel story. So let's move ahead to First Samuel. Now, with First Samuel, we have a bit of a tiny issue. I cannot reconstruct the first several chapters of First Samuel. It's very difficult, and the reason it is is we're told the birth story of Samuel in chapter one to three of First Samuel. Scholars have looked at this for the last several hundred years and said, you know, all the puns in Hebrew, they don't point to a guy named Samuel. They point to a guy named Saul. So, is this Saul's birth story? Was this originally Saul's birth story? It probably was. And it's almost unrecoverable. We don't have that access to the early story. Was it in the book of Jesus? I don't know. It might have been in this early Deuteronomy play. Again, I cannot reconstruct it. I just cannot. Because it, it's almost impossible at this point. The Samuel story is, has, by J probably, has completely destroyed it. So... As far as I can go, is to break right in with the Samuel story, and that would be in 1 Samuel 7.15, where we got Samuel judging Israel. And then Samuel becomes old, he made his son judges over Israel, and it mentions who the names of his children are. And the elders come, you are old, and your son do not follow in your ways, appoint for us a king to govern us like all the other nations. Now this is, um... What's going to happen in this chapter is this is somewhat anti-monarchy, which is, might be ironic because, as I'm placing it in the late 2nd century, they're being ruled by monarchs. Realize that that is Platonic, that is from Plato, to be anti-monarchy. You're going to have to do this, but it's not the most ideal thing. Ideally, you would have judges. Ideally, you would have philosophers. But, this is what you get. When you, when you have a king, Deuteronomy chapter 17, this is what you got to do. So there's this long discourse back and forth. Okay, now, um, you shouldn't do this, and if you do, this is what's going to happen. So then we get into the Saul story proper, uh, in First chapter, chapter 9. I think some of this is originally in the book of Jesus. Now, with Saul, we have J interpolated on top of this. Uh, in 1 Samuel 10, this is kind of hilarious. So, what the Deuteronomist is doing, without all the G editions, without what probably was in the book of Jesus, this part in 1 Samuel 10 is kind of interesting. He makes Saul into a prophet. And this is where you get the line, there's Saul among the prophets. Because he tells him, when you go, you're going to meet these people, this is going to happen, and the spirit of prophecy will come on you, etc., etc. Now, notice this part here, because, um, 1 Samuel 10, 15, Saul's uncle said, tell me, what did Samuel say to you? Now, why is, do you notice something here? Saul's uncle. Now, who is Saul's uncle? Do you know your, your Bible well enough? He kind of, you know, if you're reading through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, you kind of know what this guy's name is. He's very prominent. His name's Abner, the son of Ner. As if that's not a literary invention, but... <laughs> His name's Abner. Not here. He's just some random uncle. So you know, the earlier layers, all that stuff in the David story, a lot of us just added on top of it. Nevertheless, 
Samuel bought all the tribes of Israel near verse 20. He bought the tribe of Benjamin near, etc., etc., etc. And so they, but when they sought him, he could not be found. Now, I need to emphasize this point. I'm hoping, I'm actually probably going to pull this piece out as a short. I need to emphasize it. First Samuel chapter 10. I want everyone to look at this. This is hilarious. Children are dying every day from malnutrition, from wars. Children are dying. Many of them are Christians. Many of them, you know, they believe in the God of this book. Children are dying. Wars are happening. You know, violent, terrorism, things are happening every day that are bad. People are being killed. People are suffering. Now listen to this. So they sought for him, but he could not be found. So they inquired again of Yahweh, Did the man come here? And Yahweh said, See, he has hidden himself among the baggage. They ran and brought him, brought him from them. What an amazing prayer. What a blessing that we sought for a guy that two two had stage fright, he couldn't be found, and there he is hidden among the baggage, because Yahweh told us exactly where he was. What a miracle. What a, what a sense of justice that is. I have to emphasize that, because it, it is pretty hilarious when you look at it. it it's a nice literary invention also. I, 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 I like what they do here. It's kind of funny, because he takes his stand among the people. He's head and shoulders taller than any of them. Um, Samuel says, Do you see the one whom Yahweh has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. And all the people said, Long live the king. Or, I think in the King James, God save the king. That's a British thing. He told the people in the rights and duty of the kingship, wrote in the book, laid it before Yahweh. He sent all the people back to their homes. Um, now, we get the story of Nahash the Ammonite. After this battle, I believe it is. Okay, chapter 12 in the Tribulation. Um, I think this. Yeah, it's after this battle in chapter 11. People said, Who is it that said, Saul shall Saul reign over it? Give, us, give, it a, give them to us that we may put them to death. But Saul said, No one shall be put to death this, this day for Yahweh has brought deliverance to Israel. Um, this is called the sons of Belial, uh, good for nothing people. And uh, this is a reference to Deuteronomy because it says there would, if someone comes to you, sons of Belial, then, then you should put them to death. Well, this, there are people like this in Saul's camp, good for nothing scoundrels. And that's, he's saying, well, okay, don't put them to death. You know, well, I'll just uh, prove myself to them. And then we get a rejection story. Um, I'm probably going to break it after first Samuel into a second half of this, but first Samuel 13:1. Now, I'm reading the NRSV, the, the uh, New Advice of Standard Version. I mean, the New Advice Standard Version. No, nevertheless, first Samuel 13:1. Saul was put no. It's literally like what. Saul was blank old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. If you read, through, if you go on Bible Gateway and look this verse up, I can guarantee you there's a whole bunch of different numbers, and none of them agree with each other, because the manuscript has this missing. This is completely missing. Saul's age and length are uncertain. The Hebrew literary said he was a year old when he began to reign, and reigned two, reign two years, which obviously is not what it meant. Um, there's, a, there's been a manuscript issue with this, and unfortunately, we can't really recover it because, because some people might say, why don't you check the Septuagint? I did check the Septuagint. I have the Septuagint right here. Want to guess what? This whole verse is missing. This whole verse, it starts off, and Saul chose for himself 3,000 men. Well, wait a minute. So, in the Masoretic text, that's verse 2. The whole verse 1 is missing from the Septuagint. It, I would argue maybe that verse wasn't even there. 
That's why it's been so corrupted and, and destroyed. Anyway, I need to just emphasize that much of the rest of 1 Samuel is going to be um, from J. The second Saul rejection story, all the stories of Jonathan, and then we get to 1 Samuel 17. Now, I have not found another book of the Hebrew Bible that is more massacred than 1 Samuel. There are scribal ears after scribal ears and manuscript issues all through this text. And if you want to go to Samuel in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Samuel Scroll, it's just as bad. This, 1 Samuel 17, most people do never know what I'm about to tell you about this. This Samuel 17. You ready for this? In the Septuagint, you pick up your, the Septuagint, and you can find it online. Look up First Samuel 17 and read, read, read it next to your Bible, your Masoretic text. A whole bunch of verses are missing. In fact, the significant verses, if you eliminate those verses and you eliminate all the chapters in chapter 16, all of chapter 16 introduces David, which I'm going to argue J. Not, not to do early Deuteronomy. First Samuel 17 has a different background story to David. David is not the son of Jesse. In fact, every verse in First, First Samuel 17 that says David is the son of Jesse is the one that's missing. Everything that ha that even hints that David is from Judah is missing. The part that remains is where Saul says. You can't go against him because he's a man of war. You're you're just a boy. Here, let me give you your armor if you're going to go out for him. So I'm generally concerned about this guy. Who is David in this story? Who was David in the original story? According to your polemist, second century historian, remember who he said David was? The son of Saul. It's not like Saul ever calls David his son, right? Oh, wait a minute, he does several times. J, the later J story, is the one that's going to make David the son of Jesse. That I need to emphasize, because I don't think people will see that. But first Samuel 17, look it up in the Septuagint. There's a lot of verses missing. And that means that essentially the majority of the rest of first Samuel is both J and later Deuteronomy edition. And I will close this video out with the final battle between Saul and the Philistines. Is it a battle? In 1 Samuel 31, and I will be dealing with the rest of the Deuteronomy history in the next video. In 1 Samuel 31, Saul dies. He actually kills himself. He gets his, who asked his armor bearer to kill him, but he doesn't want it. The guy doesn't want to do it. Saul kills himself. Armor bearer kills himself. Game over. I'll just Gear up ahead in the second Samuel verse chapter one. Um, if you read this, it has an introduction about David defeating the Amalekites and Ziklag, and I'm gonna argue that's a J story. You gotta watch this. Because J does something completely different. J claims that this Amalekite killed him. J does not like the Amalekites very much. I want you to not notice that because Every time the Amalekites are going to be mentioned in a later J story, they're being killed, they're being put to death, they're bad people. I don't think the early Deuteronomy has this, so I think the early layer is essentially Saul's death by suicide. There might be a hint that maybe part of the Second Samuel 1 story from the book of Jesus, but we're going to leave that alone. I will deal with the rest of Second Samuel on um, a later, uh, on the next video. Let your foundation be safe.